Welcome to our webinar, Leveraging Reverse Transcriptase in HIV, Past, Present, and Future. My name is Jonathan Shapiro from the National Hemophilia Center at Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv, Israel, and I'll be chairing our program. Important new data on next generation reverse transcriptase inhibitors are being presented and published at an increasingly rapid rate. This three hour virtual program offers an educational opportunity for healthcare practitioners to both revisit the history of RTIs and become informed on recent developments in the field. The program will present and discuss preclinical and clinical information regarding three classes of RTIs, NRTIs, NNRTIs, and NRTTIs. Our first session will, stop, will start with a talk by Judith Currier on the historical perspective, inhibiting the RT enzyme and controlling the AIDS pandemic. Next, Dan Karitskis will speak on the mechanisms of NNRTI. And finally, Marty Markovich on the mechanism of action of NRTI and NRTTI. This will be followed by a Q&A question and answer session. During that session, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible submitted by you uh, online. You can use that by using the form, clicking the right-hand side. At the conclusion of the program, we will have a survey and we'd be grateful uh, if you could complete it. And a special thank you to MSD, who's provided us with an unrestricted grant for this program. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Judith Currier is Professor of Medicine, Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease and Co-Director of the Center for AIDS Research and Education in the Department of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. She was elected Chair of the NA-sponsored AIDS Clinical Trial Group in 2017 and is currently the Principal Investigator of the UCLA AIDS Prevention and Treatment Clinical Trials Unit. She's been involved in the clinical care of HIV patients for over 25 years. Her research has focused on HIV therapeutics and long-term complications with an emphasis on sex differences in antiretroviral therapy, cardiovascular disease, and women's health. We are honored to have Dirk Courier speak to us on the historical perspective of inhibiting the RT enzyme and curtailing the AIDS pandemic. Good morning. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today and provide this historical perspective on inhibiting the HIV-1 reverse transcriptase enzyme. Um, I am pleased to have this opportunity. I think that this is how you know you're getting old when people start asking you to give the historical perspective. But it, it's um, been fun to think back and, um, and reflect really on the history of uh, reverse transcriptase inhibition. Uh, my disclosures are shown on this slide. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be reflecting um, on the role of RT therapy. And I wanna start the story just taking you back uh, to the beginning of the HIV pandemic when the first cases were reported um, from Los Angeles in 1981. And at that time, we really had no idea what was gonna become of this um, infection. We didn't know what caused it. We had no idea how widespread it was and of the devastation that would follow. I, I think many of us have been reflecting back to the beginning of HIV over this past year as we face the global pandemic of coronavirus. And many of the lessons that we learned when combating HIV have been really, we've marshaled some of those resources and some of those responses to try to deal with COVID-19. So in 1981, uh, when HIV, uh, when AIDS was first described, um, it was, took three years before we even knew the causative agent, HIV-1, a retrovirus. So that was a long time when people were sick and we didn't know for sure what the cause of the disease was. And I think that um, reflecting back, what was also true is there was this sort of predominant feeling that as a retrovirus, this was gonna be um, very difficult uh, to, to treat 
retroviruses were really not thought to be pathogenic in humans. They'd been rare exceptions where they were causes of T-cell leukemias. And the, the idea that the virus integrated into the host DNA was really thought to render this untreatable. Um, so efforts to think about therapy, you know, we faced a really big uphill battle. Um, and, and AZT, the dideoxythymidine, was the first um, agent that was shown to have in vitro activity against this new virus. The history of AZT is an interesting one. It was first synthesized at the Na National Cancer Institute in 1964 as an anti-cancer drug. Um, in the 1974, it was shown to have activity against the murine leukemia virus. And this is what led to um, people looking at it, uh, particularly the group at the NCI, Sam Broder um, and, and colleagues. And it, its activity was demonstrated then in 1985, so four years after the first cases of, of HIV, they demonstrated in vitro that this drug could inhibit the replication of this retrovirus. And this led to a partnership between investigators at NCI, at Duke, and at Burroughs Wellcome, um, who took on the development of this agent for clinical use. Um, at this time, you know, when AZT was first shown to have activity, um, December of 1986, we had 28,000 cases of AIDS in the US, and half of the people who'd been diagnosed had died. Almost 80% of those who'd been diagnosed before 1985 had died. And this is a reflection of the fact that people were diagnosed very late in the course of disease um, based on their clinical uh, presentations. And we had really limited interventions. So when the first studies showing the clinical benefit of AZT came out in 1987, um, it was really a landmark development, um, being able to show that an antiviral drug could slow the clinical progression of a disease. So reducing the progression to AIDS-defining illnesses um, over a period of months was really a major step forward. You know, now in retrospect, it seems like you know, the, the clinical activity was fairly limited, but at the time, it really opened the door to the idea that we could treat this disease. Um, it was also around this time that um, research groups were forming, and one in particular, um, the AIDS Clinical Trials Group that I've been associated with since the early days, um, was started in 1987. It was established as an AIDS treatment evaluation unit, and it was an alliance of academic, industry, and government investigators, all working together, importantly, with community representatives. Um, it was funded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and other collaborating institutes, and the group participated in some of the pivotal studies of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors both alone and in combination. And this um, really set the stage for the ability to do drug development studies um, rapidly um, across uh, different areas. So not too long after the activity of AZT was demonstrated, we began to see some of the um, limitations of these of monotherapy with this class of drugs. And the first reports of of HIV with reduced sensitivity to zidobudine uh, were reported in 1989, so just a couple of years later. Interestingly, in this first report, the clinical significance of drug resistance um, was not yet fully appreciated, and it was acknowledged that it was unclear what the clinical significance would be. I mean, we, we soon learned that resistance really did limit the efficacy of monotherapy and led to the development of combination therapy with these classes um, of agents that were all RT inhibitors. This was a very dark time in the history of HIV. While we did have a therapy um, and other um, RT inhibitors shortly followed after AZT, the ability to prolong life significantly was um, somewhat limited. And 
Um, at this time, by 1994, 93, 94, AIDS in the United States was the leading cause of death for people the ages of 25 to 44. Um, and this was really uh, kind of the, the, um, the worst time in the HIV pandemic um, because of the limitations of the therapy that we had available. We were starting to appreciate development of resistance as well as a range of toxicities that limited the long-term use. So uh, as was noted, AZT was approved in 1987 and following up upon that, other RT inhibitors came into use, didanazine um, and DDC, and then stavudine or D4T um, in 1994, which was thought to be less toxic in terms of um, bone marrow suppression. And really in 1995, when lamivudine or 3TC was approved, I think was the beginning of a turning point because this was when combination therapy with combinations of RT inhibitors really began to show a benefit. The first non-nucleoside non -nucleoside RT inhibitor, nivirapine, was approved in 1996. And um, but at this time, we also really began to fully um, experience the number of toxicities related to thymidine nucleosides and mitochondrial toxicity, but then other toxicities uh, from this, these um, agents including um, renal insufficiency, rash, and hepatotoxicity, hepatotoxicity importantly, with uh, nivirapine. Um, we had many challenges uh, in, in treatment, when to start treatment and who to treat. We struggled with how to maximize the benefit of these time-limited therapies. We focused a lot of effort on preventing and managing drug resistance um, through the use of combination therapy, toxicity through the use of dose reduction, and even the consideration of treatment interruptions as a way to manage both resistance and toxicity. Concurrently with these developments, progress was being made in the treatment of and prevention of opportunistic infections. And it was really the, the culmination um, of these uh, activities that led to the combination therapies um, that paved the way for what was called the era of highly active antiretroviral therapy or combination therapy, including nucleosides and protease inhibitors um, that came onto the scene in 1996. Um, in retrospect, you know, this sharp decline that we saw in the rate of death to AIDS in the United States following from 1995 to 1997 um, was attributed to the emergence of combination therapy, including protease inhibitors. But I think the combination therapy with nucleoside RTIs, um, as well as improvements in prophylaxis, um, also contributed to what soon became um, rapid declines in, in, in improvement in life expectancy. These developments um, subsequently additional agents in both the nucleoside and nucleotide RT inhibitors and the NNRTIs um, became available um, and continued development to improve toxicity um, and in improve efficacy uh, followed newer generation agents that were developed, had less toxicity, could be um, used long-term in combination. And then in the NNRTI class, we saw um, the development of new agents that were, had a higher barrier to resistance and lower rates of toxicity. So in, in conclusion, just this perspective, these RT inhibitors and specifically the dideoxynucleosides offered the first evidence that it was possible to treat HIV. Um, and I think in retrospect, um, I don't know that we fully appreciate you know, how much of a challenge that was at the time. The studies of AZT monotherapy documented the ability to improve clinical outcomes and also importantly, the ability to prevent transmission. Um, the prevention of transmission, of perinatal transmission with AZT um, that was uh, published in 1997, I think really um, led the way for thinking about the use of antiretroviral therapy for prevention 
um, bet um, between individuals and not just perinatal prevention and led to the development of, of pre-exposure um, prophylaxis. I think it's also important to reflect that the clinical research infrastructure to evaluate new treatments um, emerged in response to these early discoveries and provided the scaffold for continued progress. The um, identification of resistance, which was described early on, prompted the use of combination therapy and, real, and revealed some important insights into viral pathogenesis. Certainly, toxicity ultimately limited the long-term use of the first-generation NRTIs, and I think as we'll hear more today um, about the use of therapy uh, without NRTIs, um, is, has emerged um, from this, these concerns about toxicity. But I think that it is important that we acknowledge that RT inhibitors really set the stage for the revolution of, in HIV therapeutics that followed. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to um, answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Courier, for the talk. Our next speaker, Daniel Karitskis is the Harriet Ryan Albee Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Karitskis has published extensively on antiretroviral therapy and drug resistance. He has chaired several key multicenter studies of HIV therapy and previously chaired the AIDS Clinical Trials Group. He served as a member of the NIH Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council and as a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services panel on guidelines for antiretroviral therapy. He has been a member of several editorial boards and serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Infectious Disease. His research interests focus on HIV therapeutics, antiretroviral drug resistance, and HIV eradication. We are honored to have Dr. Kariski speak to us on NNRTI mechanisms of action. Well, let's talk about the mechanism of action of non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These are my disclosures. Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors are reversible, non-competitive, allosteric inhibitors of HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. They bind to an induced pocket remote from the active site which is why we consider them malosteric. They don't directly compete for binding with the nucleoside uh, analogs or with the uh, nucleoside triphosphates. They are generally specific for HIV-1, having little or no activity against HIV-2. They generally have low genetic barrier to resistance, and the pattern of drug resistance may be clade-specific. This slide shows the structure of uh, the five currently approved uh, NNRTIs uh, for treatment and one used for prevention, depivirine. And you can see that by and large, these are uh, heterocyclic uh, complex molecules. This slide shows a ribbon diagram of the reverse transcriptase. Uh, here you see the mutations that confer resistance to uh, thymidine analogs, and here the resistance uh, position for uh, 3TC and FTC. And you can see the uh, RNA template, uh, the uh, growing uh, DNA uh, complement, and the incoming uh, triphosphate, in this case, uh, thymidine triphosphate. Uh, this is where a nucleoside uh, RT inhibitor would bind, but the NNRTIs bind here, at, as I said, at a remote site. By doing so, they alter the conformation of the enzyme in a way that prevents it from uh, carrying out its function of, uh, uh, of creating a double-stranded DNA version of the uh, RNA uh, genomic material of the virus. Here you see a picture of, uh, or a, um, a diagram of nevirapine uh, bound in that pocket and you can see these two tyrosine residues at positions 181 and 188 uh, uh, have important stacking interactions uh, with nevirapine, as they would with other uh, NNRTIs. And that's why uh, these drugs are less active against HIV-2, uh, in which case these two tyrosines are usually uh, altered uh, to have a different amino acid. 
There are now uh, quite a large number of mutations that have been described that confer resistance to the various NNRTIs. Uh, some of these are now uh, easily uh, recognizable mutations and some uh, are quite varied. So for example, uh, the key resistance mutation for efavirenz is typically uh, uh, the K103N mutation and the key nevirapine resistance mutation is typically a Y181C, uh, a mutation that also uh, sensitizes the virus to zygovudine and to stabudine, a drug we no longer use, uh, and confers partial resistance to etravirine. The key resistance mutation for real piverine is found at position 138 and is an E to K change. But there are a host of other mutations, and now there are nearly as many NNRTI resistance mutations as there are protease inhibitor and integrase inhibitor resistance mutations. And it's really important to go to an appropriate source to look up uh, the significance of these mutations because even the experts have trouble uh, keeping these uh, in their minds. Important information about which mutations uh, affect the clinical response to etravirine uh, came from the DUET 1 and 2 trials. By analyzing the uh, proportion of uh, participants whose viruses carried these mutations and what change in virus load or what, how likely they were to achieve virologic suppression, a, a number of mutations were uh, found and assigned relative weights. With, um, uh, you can see uh, here in the table, uh, ranging from uh, one to three. The most common resistance em uh, mutations emerging at the time of etrovirine failure in these trials were changes at positions 179 and 181. A note particularly that the, a 181i or v mutation uh, gave very high, uh, gave a, a factor of three, and the 181c uh, uh, gave a factor of a two and a half. Now, if we look at how these factors uh, contributed to uh, the virologic response, uh, participants whose uh, etravirine weighted genotype score was two or less had uh, the highest response rates of about 75% achieving uh, full virologic suppression. Those that had scores between two and a half and three and a half had about a 52% response rate, and those with a higher uh, weighted score uh, had only about a 38% uh, response, really not much different than placebo. And what's important here is that, recall that the 181C uh, by itself already gave a uh, two and a half uh, uh, factor uh, of resistance, meaning that just that one single mutation, a common nevirapine resistance mutation, would uh, significantly impair the clinical response to etravirine. Now, in the case of real piverine, uh, which used to be called uh, TMC278, uh, we see a very different uh, uh, and interesting pattern of resistance. These data come from the phase three trials of real piverine, the ECHO and THRIVE studies, in which real piverine was compared to efavirenz. You can see that there were uh, roughly uh, similar proportions of uh, participants who developed an NRTI resistance at the time of treatment failure. Those in the real piverine arm saw the emergence of E138K, and as expected, those in the efavirenz arm had emergence of the K103N. But what was curious is that uh, nearly uh, twice as many uh, people in the real piverine arm had emergence of nucleoside resistance as compared to the efavirenz arm. And while the most common mutation there was a mutation for 3TC or FTC resistance, in the case of the real piverine arm, it was the M184I mutation, whereas in the case of the efavirenz arm, it was the more familiar M184V mutation. We were interested in why this particular pattern of M184I occurring together with E138K uh, was observed, and so we constructed a series of site-directed mutants and recombinant viruses in order to be able to do uh, some growth competition experiments uh, in the absence and presence of drug. What we see is that uh, all of the mutations, the 138K and the two uh, mutations for uh, uh, thiocytidine uh, resistance, uh, led to a reduction in replication capacity in the absence of drug. And that replication capacity was, was restored uh, when either the 184I or the 184V mutation uh, 
uh, was combined with the 138K, suggesting actually mutual uh, benefit uh, that is the um, uh, impaired replication uh, associated with the 184 mutations was improved just as the uh, 138K mutant was improved uh, by the 184 mutations. But in the presence of drug, um, a more specific story emerges, uh, particularly when 3TC and uh, etrovirine were both uh, added to the tissue culture medium uh, together. You can see that the greatest benefit was uh, to the virus uh, occurred when the 138K mutation was present together with the 184I, significantly more than with 184V, uh, potentially explaining uh, why we see this particular combination of mutations emerging. This was also seen at the level of the reverse transcriptase activity. Uh, here we uh, looked at RT activity in the viral supernatants, and you can see uh, greater activity when the 138K and I were present together uh, as compared to the 138K with the 184V mutation. Well, let's turn now to talk about the newest uh, NNRTI uh, inhibitor, doraverine, and some of the resistance uh, properties that we see with uh, this agent. Uh, doraverine, by and large, is uh, quite effective against viruses that uh, uh, carry mutations that are common uh, to the other uh, NNRTIs, but uh, is, um, re resistance to this drug is conferred by mutations at position 227, uh, as well as position uh, 106, uh, and uh, also uh, when those are combined uh, with uh, mutations at uh, uh, 221, you can see uh, very high levels uh, of, uh, of resistance. Also, uh, not just 106i, uh, but uh, 106m. Uh, however, if we look at the more usual NNRTI resistance mutations, we can see that doraverine uh, continues to have good activity against viruses that carry the efavirenz resistance mutation at 103, the nevirapine resistance at, uh, at 181, uh, as well as combinations of those mutations uh, as illustrated here and compared to rolpivirine uh, and efavirenz. We can also see that uh, the, uh, that doraverine is effective against viruses that carry the 138 mutation, uh, which, uh, as we discussed previously, is responsible for uh, resistance to rolpivirine. In looking at doraverine-selected NNRTI uh, resistance, uh, there are mutations that confer high-level doraverine resistance, but uh, some of those mutations showed only uh, uh, tenfold or less resistance to uh, etrovirine. Mutations carrying the 227C mutation, which is one of the key resistance mutations for doraverine, also uh, demonstrated increased susceptibility to the nucleoside RT inhibitors, another example of mutational interaction as we've seen with the Y181C mutation for nevirapine, and that includes sensitization to tenofovir. Also of note, the replication capacity of doraverine resistance mutations, uh, uh, mutants, uh, was generally uh, quite poor, uh, less than a 10 to 20 percent uh, that of wild type. At the recent Virtual AIDS 2020 conference, Dr. Asante Apaya presented an analysis of doraverine resistance in a collection of more than 4,000 patient samples that had been submitted for resistance testing uh, and, and had resistance to other approved uh, NNRTIs. Uh, and these were samples collected uh, during the period uh, 2018 to 2019. You can see that these uh, samples had uh, a nice distribution of the typical uh, NNRTI resistance mutations that we've, uh, with which we've become uh, familiar. And importantly, uh, if we look at the distribution of doraverine uh, susceptibility, you can see that it was really only once there were four or five NNRTI resistance associated mutations uh, present in the virus that we saw uh, shifts of three or five fold in the uh, IC50 for doraverine. In addition, the investigators analyzed the response uh, clinically uh, to doraverine in participants in the clinical trials 
who had uh, presence of the 106i mutation at baseline. Uh, there were relatively few such participants, only eight out of nearly 1,000 participants, but seven of those eight were able to achieve virologic suppression. Uh, by comparison, in the Favrin's control arm from one of those trials, uh, there were four such participants, only two of whom achieved virologic suppression. And curiously, uh, in the Darunavir arm, uh, the trial with the Darunavir comparator, uh, where you wouldn't really expect any effect of an NNRTI resistance mutation on uh, protease inhibitor susceptibility, only four out of seven suppressed, suggesting other reasons for virologic failure. Uh, from uh, this analysis, uh, we can conclude that uh, uh, patient samples that have the common NNRTI resistance mutations, including those at positions 103, 106, and 181, remain susceptible to, to duraverine. And although single mutations such as the Y188L can confer resistance to duraverine, in general, at least four mutations are required to reduce duraverine susceptibility. And of course, uh, as just discussed, the presence of the 106i mutation by itself uh, seems not to have any significant effect on uh, clinical response to duraverine. So in conclusion, the non-nucleoside RT inhibitors have a unique mechanism of action as compared to the nucleoside RT inhibitors. A wide range of mutations confer resistance to these uh, drugs. Resistance patterns may vary by clade, and newer NNRTIs may have activity against viruses resistant to first-generation and second-generation NNRTIs. Thank you very much, Dan. Our next speaker, Martin Markovich, is the Anne and George Babalas Professor of Research in Clinical Infectious Disease in the Department of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at Columbia University Medical College and is clinical director and staff investigator at the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center in New York. His research interests have included the pathogenesis and treatment of acute HIV, the fitness and transmission of drug-resistant virus, and investigation of numerous novel antiretroviral agents, as well as pathogenesis-based interventional trials. Dr. Markowitz has authored nearly 200 scientific publications and serves as a peer reviewer for a wide spectrum of journals and is a formal chair of the AIDS Research Review Committee for the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Markovich served as a member of the HIV AIDS Task Force of the UN Millennium Project. He has been a recipient of the Amford Award of Courage, the Callan Lord Community Health Award, and an honoree of the community-based organization Mother's Voices for his work on HIV treatment. We are honored to have Dr. Markovich speak to us on the mechanisms of action of NRTI and NRTTI. Good day. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about the mechanisms of actions of nucleoside RT inhibitors and a new class of drugs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitors. Here are my disclosures. When coming up with a title for this talk, I thought an appropriate title would be Back to Basics, since I've been charged with talking mainly about mechanism and thinking about how drugs work. So today I'm going to review the basic science of reverse transcription, talk about the mechanism of action of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and introduce to you the first nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, Islatravir, and talk a bit about resistance to both classes. So just a bit about the basics of reverse transcription, we could probably spend an hour talking about it. Double-stranded DNA is synthesized from single-stranded RNA used as a template. And this is basically the process by which reverse transcription occurs. Reverse transcriptase, the enzyme that facilitates reverse transcription, has two basic functions. First, the DNA polymerase activity, or the copy function, which we know is error prone, and the RNase H activity, which serves to degrade the RNA template in the RNA DNA complex. And this activity is facilitated by reverse transcriptase function, which has a thumb, palm, finger 
structure. Critically, initiation of reverse transcription requires a primer, and within the cell there's host transfer RNA with a three prime hydroxy group that binds to the primer binding site and initiates reverse transcription. Very importantly, DNA synthesis occurs in the newly infected cell. And it's been a long time since all of us took biochemistry. So I just wanted to put in some nice pictures that shows how the process normally occurs. So the primer provides a template for incorporation of the DNTP at the P site. And the process incorporates a monophosphorylated deoxyribonucleotide at the end site. And this is a, a critical because there's formation of the deoxyribose backbone of a double helix and eventual base pairing in the double-stranded DNA. And on the right, you can see as how the triphosphorylated nucleotide provides the energy for this reaction. And then to the right, you can see how the monophosphorylated nucleotide is incorporated into the backbone of the uh, forming DNA chain. Now, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors are analogs of naturally occurring nucleotides. And perhaps the first and best known of this uh, class of drugs initially was idovidine or AZT, which is shown on the right of this slide. And you can see quite clearly that the difference between the natural uh, substrate thymidine and the drug AZT is the presence of a three prime hydroxy group. So how does AZT work or the whole class of nucleoside RT inhibitors? Well, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors lack that critical three prime hydro hydroxy group. And these drugs complete, uh, compete with uh, DNTPs in the cell for incorporation into the nascent minus strand DNA and the subsequent plus strand DNA and cause chain termination. So you can see here's the drug, triphosphorylated. That triphosphorylated moiety provides the energy for incorporation of the um, monophosphorylated drug now into the nascent chain. And because there's no hydroxy group here, there's chain termination. And that's the basic way in which these drugs work. Now, currently, these are the clinically relevant NRTIs. The adenosine analogs, tenofovir, the TDF, and tenofovir alafenamide. The cytosine analogs, lamivudine and entricytabine. The guanosine analog, abacavir, and the thymidine analog, zidovudine. And I say that these are the clinically relevant NRTIs because if you go into current treatment guidelines, including US, WHO, et cetera, these drugs are included as uh, potential treatments, et cetera. They may not be first line, they may be alternates, et cetera. But these are the drugs that are still mentioned in treatment guidelines. I think it's very important to remember, and I try to uh, uh, hint at this, that uh, NRTIs are pro-drugs, which means that they need to be uh, either dye or tri phosphorylated by cellular kinases in order to become active drugs. And this occurs intracellularly. And it is the levels of intracellular dye or tri phosphated um, uh, NRTIs that really determine the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of this class of drug. And it's very important to remember that relative levels of natural substrates or DNTPs and the phosphorylated NRTIs, the inhibitors, may vary depending on levels of cellular activation and relative levels of cellular kinases and transporters. And this all comes together to make this class of drug a very cell dependent. And this actually has played out very interestingly in uh, the story about uh, a TDF as prevention in a difference between rectal transmission and uh, vaginal transmission. In talking about um, the uh, nucleoside RT inhibitors, 
I would be remiss if I didn't talk a bit about TDF and TAF. As you know, TDF or tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate is the formulation of tenofovir that has been with us for many, many years. And uh, tenofovir alafenamide or TAF is uh, the newer formulation of the same drug. And uh, TAF basically was uh, formulated to try to get around some of the toxicity issues of tenofovir. And um, on this slide, you can see at the bottom that TDF is very well absorbed and rapidly converted into free tenofovir in the plasma. And then that tenofovir goes into cells where you want it to go, but it also goes into cells where you don't want it to go. And it is thought that that high level, that high plasma level is associated with some of the um, uh, adverse events associated with TDF, like bone disease and renal disease. On the other hand, TAF, which is given at a much lower dose, results in much lower systemic levels of tenofovir, as you can see by those little uh, blue dots, but is preferentially taken up by uh, PBMCs and lymphocytes, et cetera, and within those cells metabolized to cathepsin A to, to the active tenofovir after diphosphate, after phosphorylation. And it's believed, and I think it's been proven at this point, that is why TAF certainly seems to have a much better adverse event profile than TDF. Now, we have been living in a less than perfect world for a long time. And there's no doubt that over the 30 years or so that we've been working with HIV drugs or that there have been enormous, enormous uh, advances. But there are still clinical limitations lipodystrophy due to my mitochondrial toxicity, which is caused by a combination of cellular mechanisms, including inhibition of mitochondrial gamma polymerase. I talked a little bit about TDF bone and renal toxicities. We do see some increases in LDL, HDL, and triglycerides associated with TAF, and abacavir does have a hypersensitivity uh, uh, issue, as well as car cardiovascular toxicity. And of course, we can never forget uh, uh, resistance to NRTIs. And internationally, it's estimated that probably 10% of patients have pre-existing resistance to NRTIs because of the transmission of NRTI-resistant viruses. And of course, treatment emergent resistance to NRTIs. And this whole topic of the clinical limitations of the current NRTIs has been nicely reviewed in a recent paper by Ray et al. in Expert Opinion in Emergent Drugs in 2018, which is referenced on this slide. Just a little bit about um, resistance to NRTIs. Um, there are two mechanisms by which uh, resistance can occur. Uh, mechanism number one is excision. And there are mutations that occur within RT that alter structure so that the incorporated chain terminating NRTI monophosphate can be excised effectively. And this is the mechanism for the so-called thymidine analog mutations that include 41, 67, 70, et cetera. And these affect all the NRT. NRTIs with the exception of lamivudine and emtricitabine. And then the other mechanism is a discrimination issue where there's decreased incorporation uh, due to amino acid changes around the active site. And these are the point mutations that are well known uh, to most of you, 65, 74, 151, and 184. And these affect lamivudine and tricitabine, tenofovir, and abacavir. And again, an obstacle to the use of these drugs. So with that background, I'm going to introduce you to a drug called Islatravir, otherwise known as MK8591, or formerly EFDA. And um, I've worked with this drug and uh, um, have written a couple of review articles. And so I refer you to um, a good review article that really does talk about uh, basic science that I wrote with Stefan Serafianos, who really did a lot of the basic science work with this drug. 
uh, and that appeared in current opinions in uh, uh, HIV and AIDS in 2018. But what I want to highlight are three structural features of this drug. First, a fluorothinyl group. Second, a fluoride group at the second ring here, and a three prime hydroxy group. And remember, as I told you earlier, all the uh, nucleoside RT inhibitors lack a three prime hydroxy group. That's how they act as chain terminators. So the mechanism of action of islatrovir is quite different from NRTIs. And the, the four prime ethinyl group actually binds tightly into a, a very well conserved portion of reverse transcriptase near the primer site. And this binding causes immediate chain termination. In addition, the presence of this hydroxy group actually increases the affinity of the drug for reverse transcriptase because it looks more like natural substrate, number one. And number two, the presence of this hydroxy group also allows for delayed chain termination. So we have two mechanisms, the initial lock in place, which prevents translocation, and then the second prolonged activity where that prevention of translocation and the presence of the hydroxy group allows for delayed chain termination. Now there's also a fluoride group here that's very important for this particular drug. And that's shown on this particular slide. So the presence of that fluoride group makes islatrovir relatively resistant to deamination uh, uh, by uh, adenosine deaminase. And here's a uh, paper that appeared in 2008, looking at the percent of, a, of the drug that is deaminated. So if you look at islatrovir, which has the fluorine, as opposed to EDA that doesn't, you can see quite clearly that over 90 minutes, the EDA is rapidly deaminated, whereas islatrovir is relatively resistant to deamination. The other important consideration is that islatrovir is super potent and active against a variety of NRTI resistant variants. So first I wanna call your attention to the top row, which looks at the activity of EFDA against wall type virus. And you can see that in this experiment, EFDA in vitro is tenfold more active than AZT which is amongst our classic NRTIs, the most active drug. You can see the relative uh, um, activities of 3TC and DDI. And tenofovir is, again, uh, not as active in vitro as, as AZT. Now I'll call your attention to these point mutations and other multiple mutations that cause high-level resistance to, um, uh, to NRTIs. Uh, particularly drugs like AZT, D4T, et cetera. And you can see that EFDA really retains activity against a wide variety of these so-called thymidine analog mutations, as well as some of the point mutations that we talked about earlier. Now, resistance to EFDA is conferred by the M184V mutation. And in this experiment, the presence of M184V did cause about a 7.5 increase in 7.5 reduction in susceptibility. However, this level of drug is, is quite easily achieved in vivo. And uh, in, in a study conducted by uh, Merck, uh, two monkeys that had, uh, uh, in, were infected with M184V viruses and had clear significant clinical progression were uh, salvaged with uh, islatrovir treatment alone. So it's very likely that um, islatrovir not only has um, potent activity against wild type viruses, but also has excellent activity against a large selection of NRTI resistant variants. And I think that drug is going to be very promising clinically. Another issue about islatrovir is that it's unlikely to be associated with my, mitochondrial toxicity. So this is a, a basically a, uh, an experiment that uh, was published by Sol et al. in 2012 
just showing that EFPA triphosphate has a very, very low affinity for uh, the gamma polymerase that's associated with mitochondrial uh, toxicity as compared to, let's say, natural substrate, which uh, is readily incorporated into um, uh, mitochondrial DNA. So um, it's believed that the likelihood that uh, EFDA or azlatrovir will cause uh, mitochondrial toxicity. So what does this all add up to clinically? And I think uh, quite excitingly, uh, Islatrovir or MK8591 has not only potent antiviral activity, but it has activity that lasts a long time because it locks in, it prevents, uh, it's an immediate and delayed chain terminator, and it's relatively resistant to deamination and excision. So as you can see here, single doses as low as 0.5 milligrams to 30 milligrams in this paper that was presented by Matthews et al. at the International AIDS Conference shows robust antiviral activity. A single dose, and you can see at day seven, at the higher doses, you still have uh, antiviral activity, and this is extends out to day 10. And just a note here that the uh, half-life of is latrovir triphosphate in humans is uh, about 120 hours. It's quite long. Similarly, in rhesus macaques, where the half-life is about 50 hours, two doses of a drug anywhere from 3.9 to 18.2 mg per kid demonstrated robust antiviral activity. So we have a drug that is extremely long-acting, and has robust antiviral activity against wild type virus. So let me show you a couple of experiments that um, my team worked on in collaboration with Merck. We first looked at the potential for Islatrovir as PrEP in the rhesus macaque SHIV model. So basically what we did was put drug on board, shown here in this blue arrow, and continue to give drug once a week orally at 3.9 mg per kid. One week after getting the drug on board, we challenged the animals repeatedly with a low dose intrarectal challenge of 50 TCID50 of our SHIV virus and followed the animals out for 24 weeks. And quite extraordinarily shown here, the treated animals were all protected whereas control animals who were only getting basically vehicle got uh, infected with uh, most of them, uh, six out of the eight uh, within one challenge, another after two, and then one more after four. And this translated into a hazard ratio of 41.5. So treated animals had a 41.5 ch uh, less chance of being infected. And you can see this is a very, highly statistically significant value. We repeated this experiment, reducing doses of MK8591 or Islatrovir, and got as low as 0.1 mg per kid and showed complete protection. We also more recently looked at the potential of uh, Islatrovir as PEP. So it, obviously, this is an IV challenge model not with a SHIV, but with SIV MAC251. So this is like giving an animal a blood transfusion of SIV infected blood. So you challenge the animal within 24 hours after, you give a first dose, and then we did once a week for four weeks, then we waited seven weeks, did once a week for three weeks, we waited seven more weeks, did once a week for two weeks, and then finally one dose. And what we found basically that we had complete protection all the way down to stage four. And at stage four with the one weekly dose, we did get two animals become infected. The great thing about that uh, experiment is that if you translate the levels of drug that were completely protective, it's believed that we could probably give a single dose orally to an exposed uh, human because of the differences in half-life and probably achieve protection for the month. Very exciting data. Uh, not sure exactly how to do that clinical trial. Again, uh, very, very exciting. One of the other things I haven't mentioned is that Islatrovir is also quite easily formulated 
not only orally, but also as a absorbable polymer. And um, there's research looking at its ability to be implanted and provide protection as PrEP over a period of a, as long as 12 months. So NRTIs do remain the cornerstone of the treatment of HIV infection. Importantly, they're prodrugs that require intracellular activation. There are issues surrounding long-term toxicities that though ameliorated, do remain, and there, thereby there, there's a niche for novel agents. I hope that um, I introduced you to a, a new exciting agent that's the first nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. The drug is potent. It has a long duration of action. It has activity against NRTI resistant variants, something I didn't have time to show you, but it does have versatility in formulation. And it does have, as I presented, potential for both treatment and prevention. It's active as PrEP in preclinical studies that are consistent with yearly implants in humans. And it's also active as PEP at levels that can be achieved for four weeks with a single oral dose. So I'm going to stop there. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I'm very anxious to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marty, for a wonderful talk and to all our speakers. And we now have time for uh, Q&A. We got some very nice uh, questions submitted uh, by the audience. And perhaps the first topic uh, would be toxicity. Um, and maybe we'll start off with TAF. Uh, this is a drug I think that we consider actually less toxic than other drugs. And one of the motivations for using it, uh, that it has actually less toxicity and an interesting question coming from colleagues in South Africa about the weight gain. Uh, we're actually seeing perhaps TAF being associated with more weight gain, and perhaps uh, our speakers would like to comment on that. Hi, this is uh, Judy Courier. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, I think this is a, it's a great question, and I, I think it's really all relative. Um, one of the things that we're learning is that it may be that relative to tenofovir, there's more weight gain with TAF because tenofovir actually is associated with weight loss. Um, I think some of the studies in for use in um, PrEP and uh, HIV uninfected people may guide us in our in our full understanding of that, and it may be a little bit different in HIV. But I, <clears throat> I think understanding really why we might see some weight loss with with uh, tenofovir maybe is also a way to look at this. The other speakers may want to comment. Yeah, this is Dan Kurtz, because I agree completely with uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Courier just said. So, you know, what's really interesting is looking at data that were presented um, also uh, uh, this past summer by uh, Patty Mallon's group, an analysis uh, of data actually collected in the United States, looking at people who are on a variety of different regimens that uh, as backbones uh, that included uh, the TDF formulation of tenofovir who then switched to TAF uh, while keeping all the other drugs the same. And in, two things are notable in that uh, uh, data set. One is that overall, everybody in the study gained weight over time, starting uh, over the several years prior to the switch to TAF. There was a, an abrupt bump in the rate of weight gain that lasted about nine months, right at the transition from TDF to TAF. And then people went back to gaining weight at the same rate that they were always gaining weight before. And I think it really does raise the question of, is there some previously unrecognized appetite suppressing effect of TDF, whether it's the formulation, the, the concentrations of tenofovir or some unknown mechanism that's uh, alleviated when you switch from TDF to TAF rather than an actual uh, weight gain stimulus caused by the allophenamide formulation. Yeah, actually, I just want to add one little thing to that that just reminded me of um, is in pregnancy. Um, the data from the IMPACT 2010 study that looked at tenofovir with efavirenz compared to tenofovir with dolutegravir and um, TAF and dolutegravir in pregnancy over just over the short term, um, looking at pregnancy outcomes, 
while there was slightly more weight gain with TAF, it was it actually turned out to be beneficial. So women who were on tenofovir did not have normal uh, or did not have the same weight gain in pregnancy, and they had there were better pregnancy outcomes with TAF. So not all weight gain with TAF is is detrimental, and this is something we need to follow up longer to see postpartum what what happens to these weight changes. So Judy, while we're on the, the issue of uh, uh, pregnancy, there did seem to be quite a difference though regarding uh, gender, ethnicity. It seemed perhaps uh, uh, women of color, this was uh, more, you think this is a, 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 a biological issue, a, a cultural issue. I, I was surprised to see such large differences. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's multifactorial. Um, more advanced disease, more immunosuppression, the, you know, the more, advance your diseases when you start therapy, the more weight that you gain. So in some studies, participants um, who are women uh, and minorities may have come in with more advanced disease and hence the weight gain is related to disease and not those other factors. Um, Women have more fat, body fat, like it or not, uh, than men. So how much fat you have to start with may lead to how much fat you gain. And then there may also be genetic differences in drug metabolism for some of the other drugs like hefavirenz that could also influence um, the amount of weight gain. So it, it's really multifaceted and there's not one simple answer, unfortunately. I or think, simple solution. I think those observations also uh, highlight the importance of really looking at uh, effects within specific populations because they could be quite different in different populations. And, uh, and you can't make a generalized statement about what a particular drug or drug combination might do in terms of weight gain or weight loss uh, over time. I, I was struck by data presented at the EX conference in uh, November from a group in the Netherlands where nobody gained weight, nobody at all, no, not in the entire population, whether they were HIV infected or uninfected. And so there was no change we can have here. <laughs> so, so, so uh, Judy, what kind of uh, counseling do you give to patients that you're putting on these regimens um, regarding the weight gain? That seems to be something relatively new, new to us. And I guess I'm sometimes challenged how much I want to make a big deal of it or not. What is your sort of typical uh, way of counseling a patient when you're starting therapy regarding that? Well, I, you know, I think it's really important that people um, are thinking for the long term and about their long term health and longevity. And so one of the key factors, um, I think important factors for longevity is exercise and diet. And I think making really conscious decisions about your level of activity, um, you know, as you're starting treatment and thinking about how to maintain a healthy diet uh, are really worth keeping in the forefront and not kind of an afterthought. So that's kind of the approach that I take. It will, you know, having some type of regular exercise will help your mental health as well as your physical health and increase your muscle mass and, you know, lean body mass as you get older. So um, I'm a really strong proponent of making that the centerpiece of uh, counseling. Uh, Marty, you touched on Islatravir and the mitochondrial toxicity. We've sort of uh, moved past that today, but that was a big part of the practice. And I think maybe some of the drugs you almost didn't mention um, uh, right. because of toxicity. So uh, just you know, a few words on that for folks. And, and I know some people are just totally scared of the drug class because of that. If you could say a few words. And- yeah, well, I, you know, I just, you know, it's again, in drug development, you really try to look at any signal you can um, before a drug goes into the clinic. And I try to present, you know, what do we know about Islatravir and what don't we know? We know a lot about the drug preclinically. And in that preclinical experiment that I did cite, it looked like it had a very low potential for mitochondrial toxicity. Now, how that will play out in the clinic remains to be seen. Mm. But I think that the, that assay has been quite predictable in the past mm. and therefore is probably a really good signal as opposed to something that would have given uh, the development of a compound pause. And that's really all we can say at this point. Sure. 
So Dan, the, the issue of uh, the interface between uh, resistance, perhaps, and toxicity, I know a lot of um, studies on the different resistance profiles of the NRTIs and the higher barrier, less, I remember the original uh, approval of uh, tenofovir dealt with, if you had two AZT mutations, you still got half a log. I mean, how much of that do you think goes into the considerations of which NRTI we, I mean, are there really a lot of resistance differences between DDI and tenofovir? I mean, is, is this being guided by, by toxicity, by, by resistance? What's your impression of our decisions on those? Well, I, I think primarily the shift away from DDI was driven by toxicity. That, that's clear. Uh, it also turns out that uh, resistance to tenofovir is less common uh, than resistance to DDI used to be. Uh, that may in part be uh, because tenofovir now is used in regimens that are overall better tolerated and more potent. And so many fewer people are going to experience uh, virologic failure and, and fewer people have an opportunity to develop uh, resistance. Uh, we've seen very low rates of K65R, the main tenofovir resistance mutation emerging in most of the phase three clinical trials. Uh, but you know, in some settings, especially in lower and middle income countries where virologic monitoring is done, less frequently uh, when tenofovir was being used with uh, 3TC or FTC and efavirenz, uh, we were seeing uh, concerning rates of K65R emerging because presumably because people were staying on a failing regimen for longer. So it's not that resistance can't happen to tenofovir, it's, it's just less frequent. And again, I think it was had much more to do with tolerability and overall regimen uh, potency than the resistance cons uh, considerations per se that led us to abandon adenosine in favor of uh, tenofovir. So, so I guess also, you know, we, we um, have sort of first and second generation uh, integrase inhibitors where resistance is, is a large difference between them. I think also we moved from unboosted PIs to, to boosted PIs and saw a big difference uh, in resistance. Uh, Marty was, was mentioning really the characteristics of that. Do you, do you think this could potentially uh, be that second generation uh, NRTTI, which would change our thinking on how it's used. Well, I, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, please go. Uh, ahead. I wasn't sure if you were saying Marty was saying. It, <laughs> yeah, no. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll get to you, Marty. Dan's comment. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, first of all, I think clearly it is a, a novel mechanism of action, and a, and uh, based on the data that have uh, been presented to date, uh, far more potent than any of the nucleoside uh, RT inhibitors that we uh, have used uh, up until now uh, and uh, appears uh, uh, to remain quite active uh, uh, against the, uh, at least in, in vitro, against the single uh, resistance mutation that is, uh, has been shown to be selected, uh, the 184B. Um, so I, I think um, it, it is likely to have a very different role uh, going forward than what we've seen with uh, the so now sort of traditional uh, nucleosides that we used as pairs. Marty, or you think this will really be something which will be used differently? In the yeah, well, you know, I, th I think there are a couple things. And first of all, the drug is ex exquisitely, exquisitely resistant to excision. Mm -hmm. And therefore that whole pathway of, of excision makes it a, a, a real a resistant repellent uh, drug when it comes to pyrophosphorolysis. But along the, on the other side, um, the discrimination side, um, first of all, it's potent, it is so potent because it is perceived as a, a nucleotide. Mm -hmm. And therefore um, it gets incorporated much more readily than traditional drugs, number one. And, and um, in vivo, at least in um, um, animals, in, in the monkey model, in two animals that were extremely sick and harboring M184V viruses, the drug as a single agent really saved, saved them, so to speak, and had r robust antiviral activity and, and immune reconstitution. So I think that experiment is also very telling. So not only can you override the M184 resistance because you get because of potency issues, but it, the activity is, is, is there. Now, how it will play out, I don't know. You know, uh, I think we have to see more, but I think the drug has a lot of promise 
particularly as we get more drugs that are new and combine it with a drug like this, we can probably uh, reduce the number of drugs some of our deep salvage patients are on and really give them a better quality of life. Yeah, so I guess that begs, and I think you also mentioned the pharmacology, the PK, and I guess, you know, those always really do go hand in hand. The resistance is also depend on your levels. And I, you, you know, we didn't go into that in detail yet, but obviously the pharmacology of this drug is, is quite unique, uh, probably come a long way from drugs like AZT and more like some of the, the later drugs, but this very long half-life with these, you know, what appears to be a high barrier. So again, there's, there's two settings you I would ask about one is indeed the naive patient where you want to combine like with just one other drug and perhaps give it less frequently. I'd like to hear about that. But the second, and I treat a lot of highly treatment experienced patients, you sort of towards the end there, you know, you're giving a uh, Truvada or Descovita and at one point you might feel that the Tanofa is really not doing anything. You just stay with the 3TC and we don't really consider the NRTIs that much in those patients. You know, we're already giving now Trugarzo and Fostemsevir and Hyde. So, it would be a charm if we had something I'd, I'd like to ask all of you about, you know, those two ways that we might be not only using it, but studying it, you know, moving forward smartly, how might we do the trials where we would look at that in those two settings? Um, well, I've thought yeah. about, I've thought about the, um, I, I think the, the naive patient is kind of easy. I don't think that's a tough, I don't think that's a tough question. But I do think that it's a difficult question in patients in deep salvage because you really don't want to make mistakes. Because if you pull too much back and rely on, and they start rebounding dramatically, I think basically what you'd want to do is probably um, add the drug and um, to, to a group of patients that are on nukes plus other things, but right. replace the nukes with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is Latrivir, and I think follow them, and then perhaps after a period of time, withdraw another drug and follow them, and then perhaps that, that might be a good way to study it, to see. You would really hope that based on um, your, on your probably virtual phenotypes, et cetera, that the patients would be able to be suppressed with Islatravir plus one fully active drug, be it Trigarzo, be it another uh, monoclonal antibody, et cetera. That's how I would try to do it, but you know, it's a complicated study. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the studies in general in the deep salvage participants are really challenging to do, fortunately, because they're they're more rare. And I think it's gonna require a tremendous collaboration really globally to identify these groups of people and come up with some strategies that can be tested because most, you know, most places only have a few, um, but, but it's still a really important, you know, they add, it adds up as you go across the globe. And I think we need to think um, collectively about how we might band together to address some of these questions. Dan, any thoughts? Or move on to no i agree i mean i think the the key piece of information that we need to, before we start constructing salvage regimens with this latrivir is what is its activity in the setting of uh, of uh, you know a large number of accumulated nrti resistance mutations uh, multiple tams uh, 65r 184b or various combinations and and doing those studies i think the you know the roadmap is has been uh, 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 laid out there by the uh, FDA and other uh, uh, groups in terms of how to do these add-on studies as what Marty was describing to see what's the additional activity in the setting of a stable failing background regimen, how much intrinsic antiviral activity is there over a seven to 14 day period of the new agent and then optimize the background. Uh, that's exactly how those studies with uh, the newer uh, salvage drugs like uh, ibolizumab and fostemsevir were done and the same will need to be done with uh, Slatrivir. If it's shown to be uh, a highly potent, then I think uh, we can start thinking about how do you use that in uh, uh, compact regimens for salvage therapy with you know one or two other agents. Uh, and we, we know from the option study that uh, at least in highly treatment experienced patients, if you have other active drugs, you don't need to continue the older nukes. Um, it's a little more complicated in second line therapy because second line and earnest and the 
uh, the other uh, um, donning have all shown there's at least some activity of some of those drugs. Uh, and, and so it's a little more challenging, but in, in deep salvage, it's pretty clear, I think, that the nukes aren't contributing very much. So I guess that, that opens the door, uh, you know, listening to your talk, thinking about deraverine. Um, right now for salvage, I'm, I'm dying to take my patients off boosted PIs, um, but that that's very difficult. It's also because the, the one salvage and the RTI we have a traverine as uh, such an inducer. And the minute you take off your boosted PIs, uh, it tanks your dilutegravir. So we don't really have a great option. I mean, you, you showed the nice data and we sort of know when to use it, but some of my patients have been on, you know, dilutegravir, darunavir, a traverine for so long, uh, quality of life is tough. And as they get older, even, even tougher now it's, you know, deraverine doesn't, do that. It, it, it's not uh, an inducer. It is affected by, by those. But, you know, the thought that we could do a study where we would have another NRTI to use and one where you could combine potentially. Any thoughts on that? I mean, you think that would be a use where perhaps we should be studying Derevarin? Sure. Well, I think the most important thing is we clearly need data. And so in order to accumulate those data, we are going to need uh, appropriately designed and, and conducted trials in that population. Uh, you know, something like the power studies uh, uh, where, uh, you know, a, a novel and an RTI, in this case, deraverine, is combined with uh, other, uh, one or a, more other agents that are expected to be active uh, in that uh, patient population should, should be done in order for us to have a sense of just how effective deraverine might be uh, in this population and in what circumstances. You know, it's really striking how little we know uh, now about our newer drugs in terms of their activity in the setting of different resistance mutations. We know what mutations may be associated with failure uh, and, and some shifts in susceptibility, but what residual activity exists, we really don't know because we're not accumulating the kinds of data that we did in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, uh, when uh, you know, we were exploring these, uh, what were then new agents in the setting of treatment failure. So, uh, Judy, your thoughts also on, um, uh, you know, the use and perhaps also, um, you know, naive patients, if you, we saw the resistance, obviously we don't have a lot of clinical data, but, you know, would you need to do resistance testing in a patient who's going to get deraverine, uh, if it's deraverine, it's Latavir, some of the thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and especially with all of these um, attempts to do almost just test and treat of getting people on treatment right away, you know, I think people are feeling comfortable doing that with integrase inhibitors, and I, I think with some of these newer regimens, it, it does seem, you know, based on the prevalence of resistance in an area that it would be feasible. It still makes me nervous, personally, uh, to use an NNRTI first line without resistance testing, but you know, I, I think that um, with more data, you know, we can be reassured. Great. We're getting pretty close. I did want um, to give each of you a minute to just if there any any closing thoughts. Uh, this is, you know, this is a topic we don't talk about a lot anymore, uh, but I think we will be with these exciting new drugs. So uh, just to give anyone uh, closing thoughts, maybe uh, we'll go around the, the Zoom. Uh, Judy, uh, bottom lines, you think? Uh, um, well, I mean, I think therapy really has been evolving and we are fortunate to have new options to use. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to the next few talks and um, hearing more about, you know, some of the, the emergence of two drug therapy as a really um, important paradigm um, for the future and getting people getting comfortable with stepping away from their two nuke backbone um, for therapy. I, I think there's, it's really great to see that, that we have these options and new developments and we need to continue to look at their, their long-term effects. So, Thank you, optimistic. Judy. Wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I share Judy's optimism. I think we have uh, great new tools in terms of uh, a, a number of new agents that uh, have uh, become available or are becoming available. And the most important thing is that we uh, do the right studies to know exactly how to use them and that we use them correctly to uh, maximize the benefit for patients. Thank you, Dan. Marty, final comments? You know, all I'll say is that, um, you know, three drug therapy, was, you know, the mathematics involved with three, three drug therapy um, was a long time ago. Yes. Uh, or was generated a long time ago in the mid 90s. Uh, 
and that was 25 years ago. And I'm just going to talk about his latrivir because I know his latrivir well because I've worked with it. I think that it is somewhat unique in its potency, barrier to resistance, and activity against drug resistant variants. So I'm very hopeful and very optimistic to use uh, to uh, uh, use Judy's uh, uh, tap into Judy's optimism that this drug will really provide an opportunity for us to really explore more compact regimens. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we'll, we'll be concluding on a, on a high note, which is nice for these challenging <laughs> times. So uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break and reconvene uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, my colleague Anton Posnev will be chairing. And, and with that, I'd like to thank our three speakers for, for wonderful talks and discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank the folks at home who submitted great uh, questions that we could discuss. And a final thank you to MSD for the unrestricted sponsorship. And with that, we'll say goodbye for 10 minutes, uh, sign off, and uh, look forward to you guys getting back on. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.